Today we're going to talk about shape. So shape is everywhere around us. And what you might not realize is how the things that we use every day are actually shaped. Things like the seat of your chair are produced by, by pulling and pushing on the materials with giant hydraulic presses to fit exactly to the contours of your body. And when it comes to shape, some of the largest things that we need to shape are for our buildings. In architecture, shape gives us form and structure, and it creates the things in which we inhabit every day. So let's first talk about a building here in Stuttgart. So this is a really controversial building, but I like it. I love the architectural features, the way that the light can enter from above, and most of all, I really like the geometry. It's smooth and elegant. But what I don't like about this building is how it's made. Because, well, as architects, we've developed digital processes to optimize our models on the screen and robotically produce the parts which make up each piece of our building. The way in which we physically do it is still, I would argue, backwards. So for these columns, for example, we actually have to build them three times. First, we build them from steel to form reinforcement, and it needs to be shaped, every single piece of steel. Then, we build it from wood, solid wood, in order to form a formwork in which we can finally pour the concrete, which will form the final piece. And in developing these processes, they've become complex and, and involve supply chains that reach around the globe. What's clear is that despite our advances, we still rely on very basic processes in order to create the shapes. And the problem with this is that they eat up tons of energy and material. In Baden-Württemberg, for example, by some recent estimates, the construction industry alone contributes over 50% of the material waste for everything that we use. And when we think about carbon and embedded energy, we often think about things like flying less, or riding our bike to work, or making our cars more efficient. But what we really should think about is the fact that buildings alone contribute dramatically more to the problems of sustainability than transport or other aspects. And when we try to solve these problems, we generally try to go more high-tech. We think about how robots can make things more efficient and processes can become more precise. But in the end, we still rely on brute force methods to form and shape our materials. For example, we carve things with higher force and more precision. Or we bend, pull, or push our materials into shape. And this just becomes a larger and larger problem as things get bigger. The robots have to become bigger. And in many cases, you might say that we even rely on aggressive processes, where the materials play a completely passive role in the final components in which they might become. So now let's imagine a different way of generating shape. So we're in a forest with trees around us and the light coming in from above, and it's completely silent. And in this forest, there's shaping happening all around us, all the time. And I'm not talking about living trees or growing things. What I'm talking about are things like pine cones or seed pods. And what these, what these pine cones are able to do is that the scales on the side of the cone are actually able to change their shape in changes with relative humidity in the air. And this means that a pine cone can, can remain closed when it needs to protect its seeds and open up only when it's dry enough at the precisely the right moment in order to release its seeds. Now, what's amazing about this is that it happens in millions of pine cones all around the world, and it does so not by a machine or a computer or a microcontroller or any sort of sensor. It does so because the hygroscopic fibers that are laid inside of its, its skin. And when these fibers get wet, they expand. And when they dry, they shrink. And what's even more astounding is that this process happens after the pine cone has been cut off from the supplies of the tree. So there's also no living energy involved. And what this means is that even a pine cone that's 12 million years old and fossilized, when we take it out, and put it in water or dry it out, it still retains the ability to change shape. Now, I absolutely love robots, 
and I love computers. <laughs> but I have to say that when I see how simply the pine cone works and how well it works in order to generate shape, I have to say that even after 12 years, I would still rely on the pine cone over a robot. Now, our goal here is to see how, if the pine cone can generate shapes so smoothly and so fluidly, we can actually use a similar approach to shape the way we build our buildings. And to do that, we use a really high-tech material. Any ideas? We use wood. <laughs> so wood is one of the most abundant natural resources on our planet. And the best part of all is that it regenerates. It comes back if we plant more trees. And we're planting more and more trees. Now, wood is involved in the construction industry for hundreds of years. But what you might not know about wood is that, just like the pine cone, it has this strange ability to change shape when it gets wet and when it dries. And this is something that has caused problems for many, many years. And scientists have struggled to figure out ways in order to keep our walls not from moving. But at the same time, if you really look at the wood, the forces inside of it are so strong that it can rip itself apart. The forces are so powerful that ancient Greeks used them to split granite blocks from their quarries. So what we want to do is see how we can harness this force in wood to generate design shapes that we want for our buildings. And in my group at the University of Stuttgart, we call this concept material programming, because similar to how we can program movement in robots digitally, we think we can also physically arrange materials in a way in which they generate shape themselves. So to do so, in our first studies, we looked at how we could take apart a tree trunk in the fewest amount of steps possible and rearrange it into a really nice shape without using any mold. To do this, it's pretty simple. We basically build a giant puzzle. So we take apart the wood, we put it into small triangles, and then we rearrange it. But each triangle has a specific direction, and this determines how it will change shape. Here we use beech wood, a wood that my grandfather likely would have split up and used as firewood, precisely because it's going to change into strange shapes, so it's not so good for anything else. But here, once we have this flat sheet, all we have to do is add water. And slowly, the shape emerges. And in the same way, again, by removing the water, we can reverse the effect. Now, this might seem like a small art project or something for a bit of fun. We can make a piece of wood change shape. Um, because these pieces are pretty small, and we could imagine shaping them with our hands or with a few tools. But when we imagine shaping something the size of a wall or a column, then it becomes hard to imagine how we might do it, or even a robot might do this effectively. And that's where we start to look at how we can upscale this process. To do so, we have to do two things. First, we have to be able to precisely predict the change in shape. And this is where our computational design tools come in, because with these tools, we can do this much more accurately than we've ever been able to do before. The second thing is that we need it to stop changing shape when we want to use it in our building, and that will come to later. So the production of these types of pieces begins like any normal sawmill. We have to first cut the logs into boards, and here we use freshly cut spruce wood, which starts with a relatively high moisture content, just when it comes from the tree. Then we combine these boards into two-ply layups, which we call bilayers. These are five-meter long, really serious pieces of wood. And when we put these bilayers into a kiln, we can dry them out, and inside, the shape emerges completely autonomously, smoothly, and coordinated, all at the same time in a giant piece of wood. <laughs> After which, we can take these bilayers that are then curved, all to the same curvature, and we can combine them to form bigger components for our building. And by layering two of them together and connecting them, we therefore stop the change in shape, meaning that we have a form-stable component. Then all we have to do is slightly trim the edges to add some detailing so that we can connect them later. We use these thin, high-curvature pieces in order to build a tower structure. 
The tower cantilevers 14 meters into the sky, yet it's built from just 90 millimeter thick CLT. On the interior, the curvature gives the wood an entirely new architectural and spatial expression. It's not something that we've seen before. The curvature is soft, almost like a pillow, and it's friendly to touch. And the best part of this is that we're able to do this in a way that is elegantly designed, ecological, and efficient. It just makes sense. Now, on the other side of the scale, we can think about smaller pieces, and we can think about how our buildings operate. Every day, we open and close our windows, or we have an automated shading system. And for many years, our group in the University of Stuttgart has been studying how we could actually use the change in shape in wood in smaller veneer pieces to build systems that operate in relation to the outside environment. To do so, we use very thin pieces of wood that respond cyclically. This means we can create systems that open, for example, when it's sunny, and then automatically close up when the rain is approaching. But there are some limitations with using wood in this way. It can only bend a certain way because it has this beautiful natural structure. So in our more recent work, we look at how we can break down certain parts of the wood and turn these into materials that we can then use 3D printing to arrange in very specific patterns. This means we can give wood a new function. We can allow it to bend. It can be flexible and it can be porous. And through doing so, we can create an entirely new generation of shape-changing mechanisms. Mechanisms that are soft, but still use the power of wood. And like the pine cone, these things can operate over and over again, reliably. They just happen to work. There's no trick, there's no machine, and there's no computer. So in the future, I think we will build buildings not with machines, but by cleverly understanding the way in which materials work, the very materials that they're made of. And it's my hope that by doing so, we can build more ecologically, smarter, higher, faster, and best of all, silently. Thank you. <laughs>